This is the first miracle that Jesus performed. Uh, it is interesting note, to note that the first miracle Jesus performed was uh, not really uh, miraculous. Uh, most people at the scene of, of the miracle did not even notice that there was a miracle. Uh, it was an unmiraculous miracle. However, it was a miracle that revealed God's glory. At the end of the description of the miracle, in verse 11, we find it says, What Jesus did here in Cana of Galilee, if you turn to, yes, right, was the first of the signs through which he revealed his glory and his disciples believed in him. It says, It was the first of the signs through which he revealed his glory. Note that the Bible often uses the word signs to describe miracles, as in this case. If you think about what sign is, the purpose of the sign, a sign, is to refer to a reality. The sign itself is not the reality. If you look at a, a, a speed limit sign, the, the sign itself is not does not actually refer to the, re it only refers to the reality. It, the purpose of the sign is to point towards the reality. So how is it that Jesus revealed his glory through this sign, this unmiraculous miracle? God's glory is revealed when God's identity is revealed. When we see God as who God is, we see his glory. The Gospel of John, in fact, begins with the glory of God. So uh, what we just read is in, in chapter 2, but in the previous chapter, begins, we find that it begins with a powerful and poetic introduction of God's identity. I believe the miracle at Cana reveals the glory of God by showing three important aspects of who God is as described in the previous chapter. The first one is God who comes to us, God the incarnate. The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. Chapter 1, verse 14. 우리에게 오시는 하나님. Second, God who gives us life, God the life. In him was life and that life was the light of all mankind. Verse 4 of the previous chapter. 생명이신 하나님. Third, God who speaks to us. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Verse 1 of the previous chapter. 말씀이신 하나님. So let us take a look at how the miracle reveals these three aspects of God's identity. The first one, God who comes to us, God the incarnate. So this miracle took place at a wedding at Cana, Galilee. A wedding is, if you think about what wedding is, wedding is a very important human affair. It is one of the most important celebrations of life. People gather together to celebrate a new family, a new life, a new beginning. The ceremony is carefully and meticulously pre prepared over a long period of time. A wedding is filled with music and food, filled with people who love and care for. A wedding is filled with thanksgivings, filled with memories of the past and the hopes of the future. We laugh together at the wedding ceremony. We, we cry together. We pray together. We celebrate together. At that time in that culture, our weddings were much more serious as they went on for a few days, not a few hours. But there was a terrible problem at the wedding. They ran out of wine. They have no more wine, said Mary, the mother of Jesus. Wine means joy. Wine signifies livelihood. Everything had been prepared well for the wedding, but there was no more wine. It's a terrible problem. Our life can be just like that, a wedding without wine. 
our life may look like we have everything on the surface, all the, on the external things. But lacking the real essence, the authentic joy. After a pretty interesting exchange of words between Jesus' mother, Mary, and Jesus himself, Jesus did not walk away from the wedding. Although Jesus said, woman, why do you involve me? By the way, you know the term woman here does not actually mean any disrespect. He, in fact, got involved. Although he said, why do you involve me? He, after all, got involved. He got involved in the terrible problem of the wedding. God, the Most High, the Most Holy, is also the God who became flesh and made his dwelling among us. He is God the incarnate. God comes to us and dwells among us in the midst of human realities, in the midst of human problems. Sometimes we think that living a Christian life is being disconnected from the human realities, human affairs. Sometimes we want to place God far away from our daily lives. Sometimes we want to see God, see the kingdom of God only in heaven. Although we were taught to pray to seek his kingdom on earth. But the God of the Bible is God who comes to us. One who searches us, who hunts us down, who lives among us. The God of the Bible is the God of the heavens and the God of the earth. In this miracle at Cana in Galilee, God revealed his glory by showing himself as God who comes to us, God the incarnate. Second, God who gives us life, God the life. So what did Jesus actually do? How did Jesus resolve the terrible problem at the wedding? Jesus did not order in perfect wine from somewhere, somewhere else. So there was no pedare minjo. Right? Rather, he changed the water which was already available in the wedding banquet into wine. God's work of salvation does not bring about replacement, but transformation. This, I think, is a very, very important aspect of who God is. Sometimes we feel like it's actually easier for us to have a replacement. Things are so bad. It would be better to just replace things entirely. It would have been actually simpler to have a substitution entirely. But God's work of salvation does not replace sinners with the righteous. Many times, many times you feel as though it would be much simpler to replace the awful and evil humans with an entirely different race. But that is not the way of God. God does not discard the old world. God does not do away with existing humans. God restores. God transforms. And this is something that I've been really thinking a lot about because my instinct is always replacement. You know, uh, a friend of mine told me, and, and I, well, I realize myself that I tend to give up on students too easily. You know, I may look like I'm a very gentle person, but I, I work with some students, and in my heart, deep inside, I give up. <laughs> Well, this is not going to work. <laughs> but I feel I've always been challenged by the fact that that's actually not the way that I should think about my students. God restores. God does not replace. <laughs> then what kind of change did God did Jesus bring about at the wedding? He brought about a change that is fundamental and essential. Jesus did not just add something into water to make it taste better 
although the new wine tasted really good, the change that happened was not like putting on icing on a cake. It was a thorough, fundamental, and essential change, a transformation. In fact, from a human perspective, the change from water into wine is an impossible change. Remember the late President Kim Young-gil when he first <laughs> read the Bible. This actually caught his attention. He was really troubled because from his knowledge of chemistry, this is not suppo supposed to work. Water to wine, that's not supposed to work. It is beyond human understanding. This, the lack of understanding, actually brings us to Jesus' encounter with Nicodemus in the next chapter. Chapter 3. There comes a man named Nicodemus. Nicodemus was a religious person, a Pharisee. He was a wise and powerful person, respected member of the Jewish ruling council. But he failed to understand the foundation of Christian life, the very basis of spiritual life. So if you read on to chapter 3, in verse 10 we read, You are Israel's teacher, said Jesus, and you do not understand these things? This is Jesus is talking, speaking to Nicodemus. So what did Nicodemus fail to understand? He failed to understand that at the foundation of Christian life is a birth. A spiritual birth. Birth is the beginning of life. Nicodemus may have had many ideas of religious practices, the holy and righteous life that one ought to live, but he did not have any idea how that life is made possible, how that life begins. Before one grows up and bears fruit, there must be a birth. Without birth, there is no growth. Without growth, there is no fruit. So if there is no beginning of life, there is nothing. In chapter 1, going back to the chapter 1 of John, verse 12 and 13, we read, Yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become, what? Children of God. Children born not of natural descent, nor of human decision or husband's will, but born of God. Born of God. See how chapter 1, chapter 2, and chapter 3, they all run in the same stream of thoughts. This verse tells us that our spiritual life begins by being born of God much like our physical life begins by being born of our parents, we become God's children and He becomes our Father. That's how we start. During the conversation between Jesus and Nicodemus, we hear the same concept expressed slightly differently, born again, born of water, born of the Spirit. We just prayed for Shirley Bowman, and she just wrote the book called Spirit Born. Jesus says in, in chapter 3, verse 3, that you cannot even see the kingdom of God, the life and the world under God's rule. You cannot even see it unless you're born again. Jesus replied in verse 3, very truly, I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they are born again. Verse 5, we hear Jesus saying, Very truly, I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless they are born of water and the Spirit. The kingdom life, the life with God, the life under His rule, is impossible without the birth. So when Nicodemus heard this, he did not understand it. He asked, how can someone be born again, born when they are old? In verse 7, Jesus says, 
You should not be surprised at my saying you must be born again. The wind blows wherever it pleases. You hear its sound, but you cannot tell where it comes from or where it's going. So it is with everyone born of the Spirit. These two words, wind and spirit, are translations of one and the same word in both Greek and, and Hebrew. So wind and the spirit, it's just one word translated differently. And this word is also used to refer to breath. So breath, wind, spirit. Just one word in Hebrew. One word in Greek. And the same word is used in Genesis chapter 2, 7 as breath. Let's read Genesis 2, 7 together. Ready? One, two, three. Then the Lord God formed a man from the dust of the ground and breathed his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living being. Breathed, breath, spirit, life. It all makes sense. What do we do when we want to check if somebody's alive? We check to see if that person is breathing. What happens to a person when he dies? That person stops breathing. Breath is, in a sense, the essence of life. Nicodemus did not understand God as a source of life, as the breath itself. Therefore, he did not understand how, how one can live as a child of God. What is sad and scary at the same time is that it is actually possible for any one of us here to live a life like Nicodemus. One can presume to live a spiritual life for a long time without ever being born of God. All the religious activities, all the religious talks and good deeds can actually be artificially manufactured. And you and I know that it is possible. We can pretend that we are alive when we are actually not. It is like wedding without wine. There is no real life. There is no breath. We should also understand that in Greek, there are two words that describe life. One is bios, which is biological life. and The other is zoe, more full, spiritual, fundamental life. And it is zoe that God is talking about. In a sense, the life of Nicodemus is like the wedding at Cana. Of course, the question that we should ask ourselves at this point is that, am I like the wedding at Cana? With all the externals all well prepared, but no more wine, no real life, because I've never been born. At the wedding in Cana, Jesus changed water into wine. This change is a fundamental transformation. This change is like rebirth, bringing breath into something that is dead. Christian life begins with birth. When we believe, we are born. We become children of God. At the wedding in Cana, Jesus revealed his glory as he revealed himself as God who brings us life. God the life. Third, God who speaks to us, God the word. How did Jesus change water into wine? He did it with his word. He spoke. He commanded, fill the jars with water and now draw some out and take it to the master of the banquet. The biblical understanding of word is radically different from our current understanding or experiences of it. 
It embodies both word and reality. When God speaks, it comes into existence. It becomes reality. There is no barrier between linguistic and existential realities. God is God of the Word. In the beginning was a Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Jesus performed his miracle, his first miracle, by speaking. And who did he speak to? Who did he command? Instead of commanding the water itself to turn into wine, he commands the servants to fill the jars with water. His command was not directed towards the water, which I think could have been a lot simpler. But it was directed towards humans. That is to say that Jesus performed the miracle through the agency of human hands and feet. This is a way of God. God chooses to work through humans. He delegates humans to take care of his creation, his kingdom. We are God's hands and feet. We are God's kingdom agents made in his image. However fragile and weak we may be, God still calls us to participate in his work. This is another very strange point, and point that's full of grace, that God would choose to work th through humans. Because, you know, we're not perfect, and we make lots of mistakes, and... Sometimes I'm afraid that if people look at me and how God uses me, that they will actually fail to understand God because I'm full of mistakes. I'm, I'm fragile. I'm, I'm not doing a good job sometimes. But so I would say, you know, if God would rather just work directly, <laughs> it would have been a lot nicer because there would be no misunderstanding. But we know that that's how God, that's not how God, God works. God works through humans, human hands and human feet. Genesis chapter 1 verse 27 and 28. In his image we are created and he commands us to take care of his creation. He invites us to the work of creation. He also invites us to his work of salvation. Make disciples of all nations. Matthew chapter 28. God is God who calls us to participate in his work because we are made in his image. Who did Jesus choose then? At Cana, Jesus chose not the master of the banquet, which would have been a very logical thing to do, but he chose the servants whose names still remain unknown to this state. Jesus used those ordinary people to reveal his glory, to reveal who he is. It was through the simple and faithful obedience of ordinary human hands that Jesus performed his first sign. But note what happened to the servants. Verse 9. And the master of the banquet tasted the water that had been turned into wine. He did not realize where it had come from. The master of the banquet did not know. Though the servants who had drawn the water knew. The servants knew. The master didn't. The obedient servants knew what happened. Unlike the master of the banquet and the rest of the wedding guests who did not know. It's kind of strange that Jesus would reveal his glory. And who knew the glory? Who saw the glory? The servants. There are so many other people <laughs> Of course, after reading the gospel, after 
after writing the gospel, many other people came to know. But at the wedding, it was only the servants. And it was good, good enough for God, in a sense, at that time. Servants experienced the miracle. They experienced God. They knew. When we have life in Christ, we have this growing desire to come to know God. To know God more and more. Deeper and deeper. And how do we know God more? How do we know God more deeply? It is through obedience to His words. Simple obedience. When you obey, you get to know God more. When you obey, you experience Him more. Handong is sort of like a little testing ground, test ground for obedience. There are so many people, your sanbeis and my sanbei professors, who simply came and obeyed. On a hopeless desert-like place <laughs> here, people came and obeyed and they experienced God. However fragile and weak they, have, they may have been, they experienced God. And they could say, I knew it. <laughs> I knew God. I know God by experience. At the wedding, Jesus revealed His glory as God the Word, God who speaks. And our response to that is obedience. Let me conclude. At the wedding at Cana, Jesus performed this first miracle that revealed God's glory. The miracle revealed who God is. Instead of, instead of turning away from the trouble at the wedding, Jesus got involved. He came to us. He re this revealed God as a God incarnate, as God who became flesh. As God who pitched his tent among us, God who comes to us. At the wedding, Jesus changed water into wine. He brought about a holistic, fundamental change in its essence. It's like rebirth in him is life. He's a breath, the source of life. This miracle revealed God's glory as God, the life as God who brings us life, God who brings about a transformation in our life. Jesus changed water into wine by speaking. Jesus spoke and there was a miracle change, remarkable change. This revealed God as a God, the Word. God is God who speaks. And when Jesus spoke, he directed his commands to the servants. And the servants obeyed, and they knew. They knew who God is by experience. Our God is a God who comes to us, a God who brings us life, a God who speaks to us. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for revealing who you are through the miracle at Cana. You are God the incarnate. You do not ignore our problems. You do not stand afar. You come close to us and live with us. Thank you that you are God the giver of life. You are the breath and the source of life. In you we find true life, life of abundance. To all who receive him, to all who believe in your name, you give that life. You give that right to become children of God, children born not of natural descent, nor of human decision or husband's will, but born of God. We thank you, Lord, for you are God the Word. You speak and it comes to be. So we want to hear your word and today, today and obey. As we obey, we will come to know you more. 
Lord, we ask that you will continue to reveal yourself to us today. We desire to know you more. We long to know you more. And knowing you is the greatest thing that could ever happen to us. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. Amen. This is the time where we have the Lord's Supper. Um, please refrain from opening your cup and drink um, for a time period. We'll do that all together. We're going to read 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 23 through 29. 1 Corinthians 11, verses 23 through 29. Let's go ahead and read this together. For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is a new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So then whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and the blood of the Lord. Everyone ought to examine themselves before they eat of the bread and drink from the cup. For those who eat and drink without discerning the body of Christ, eat and drink judgment on themselves. Amen. I want to just take a second to highlight verse 26. If we can put 26 up there. I think this is kind of a summary of the Lord's Supper. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Um, I believe one of the reasons that God gives us the Lord's Supper is partly because we are such a forgetful people. Um, And remembering the Lord's death, it has a lot of practical implications for our lives. It's important for us to think on it. One, one, the prominent thing that we think of with the Lord's death is that it delivers us from the penalty of our sins, right? Christ so loved the, God so loved the world that he sent his son to die, um, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. Christ was our substitute on the cross, bearing every sin that you would commit, past, present, and future. All of that was taken on the cross so that you could have a relationship with God and have eternal life. Um, but not only did he, on the cross, when we're remembering what Christ did, this is a part that we sometimes don't emphasize well in the church, is that Christ also broke the power of sin on our lives. In the book of John, Christ says, he who sins is a slave of sin. Many times you don't even want to do what you end up doing, but you do it anyways. There's a sense in which sin sin enslaves us. It keeps us from having a full relationship with God that we desire. It keeps us from having a right relationship with others. And so one of the things that Christ did on the cross was he broke the power of sin. He who the Son sets free, he says in John, is free indeed, meaning that we are no longer slaves of sin. That's, that's important to remember because Satan comes to you all the time and says, you'll never be free. You're not a good Christian, and maybe you're not even saved. Many times he condemns us. He tempts you to fall, to sin, and then he says, now feel really bad. Feel so bad you don't read the Bible. Feel so bad that you don't come to church. Feel so bad. Call yourself a hypocrite. So many times the enemy comes and condemns us, and we find ourselves stuck in sin. When, you, when we look back at what Christ did 2,000 years ago, It's a remembering that he even broke the power of sin over our lives so we would no longer be slaves of sin. That Romans Romans 8, 7 says the natural mind is at enmity at God. It cannot submit to God's will. Because the power of sin was broken over our lives and because God gives us the Holy Spirit to make us holy, now you desire the word of God. Now you desire to obey God. Where before we tried to ignore God, do our own thing. Now we have this new nature that desires him and wants to follow him. The power of sin was broken over our lives, right? And one day we'll be delivered from the presence of sin when when we die and we go to heaven or when Christ comes, whatever happens first. But the second part that he emphasizes, so this remembering because of all the implications, the the, uh, deliverance from the penalty of sin, the power of sin, one day the presence of sin at Christ's coming or at our deaths. But the last thing is you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. One of the things that we also forget and commonly live without a revelation of is that we are simply servants of God. 
Your body, in fact, you didn't stop being a slave when Christ died. You actually just transferred your allegiance. Scripture says now we're slaves of Christ. Paul would often start his letters calling himself a slave of Christ Jesus. 1 Corinthians 6, 19 through 21, to these believers who were still going to probably the temples and sleeping with prostitutes there, he says, don't you know that your body is not your own and that you were purchased with Christ, so you were purchased, and so glorify God with your body. You're owned by someone else. And so we have now become slaves of Christ. So part of being a slave or a servant of Christ is that he's your master over your thought life. He should be your master when you're playing, spending time on the Internet. He should be your master in the entertainment that you, you put in. He should be your master in your goals and your dreams and how you plan to serve him long term. And one day you're going to give an account. We're going to give an account of our stewardship of what we have done with our bodies, with our minds, with our talents, with our gifts. And so this is part of what we remember. He, our master is coming soon. And there will be an accountability of what we have done with all the gifts and abilities and our bodies, which are now submitted to him. Um, John Stott said, one of the secrets to the Christian life is learning how to live in the tension of looking back. So he said, something you can't do humanly possible. You can't look in two directions at the same time. We look in one direction or the other. But the Christian life is learning how to look back to what he did and live in application of it, that he, you've been set free, so you're turning away from sin. You've been set free, so the way you spend your time is different because now you're a slave of Christ. But at the same time, reeling that your master is coming. Um, Philippians chapter 3, I think it's 17 through 21, says we are citizens of heaven and we eagerly await our Savior who was, who's coming from there and who will one day give us new bodies. There should be this eager expectation where we're looking forward, hopefully for our master that, that's coming, but also a looking back and remembering so that we can live in application of this death. And so one of the things that we do during the Lord's Supper is this both, we try to reset our focus to both looking back and looking forward to his coming. And we do this in part because because Christ took the penalty for your sin and because he broke the power of sin and because one day he's going to deliver you from the presence of sin, we spend some time, take, when we take the Lord's Supper, in examining ourselves. You had a master that enslaved you. Even if you came to Christ at a young age, a master that held you in sin, and because paid, Christ paid the ultimate penalty, why do you keep going back? And so one of the things we do right now is we examine ourselves and we confess, am I living in unforgiveness towards a parent? Or am I living in unforgiveness towards a neighbor or toward a boyfriend or a girlfriend or someone that hurts you? Am I operating in sin on my, time, my free time on the Internet, which is a tremendous temptation towards in free time in this, in, this, in this winter vacation? Are there any ways that I'm not living in the reality of what happened in my past that he took the penalty and broke the power? Am I going back to the person that he died to separate me from? And so right now is a time where we examine and we confess those things um, so that we can start to live in the reality of one day he's coming soon. And there's a kingdom to be built now. Uh, there's a kingdom in the spirit, in the hearts of people as they come to know Christ. There's a kingdom to be built now. And so during this time, it's a refixing our eyes, remembering what happened in the past, and looking forward to his coming. And so right now, if we could just spend some time in confession, examining ourselves. And I should add this in here as well. If there's anybody in here, he says, if you take this cup and you, and you have not examined yourself, you take it unworthily. If you have never come to a place in your life where you have believe that you're a sinner under God's wrath, meaning if you die today, you'd be separated from God forever, eternity. That's how holy God is. If you have never believed that reality that you cannot be good enough to, to get to heaven, good enough to have a relationship with God, if you don't believe that, if you don't, you have to believe that Christ died on the cross for your sins, that he rose from the dead so that you could have an eternal life, and you have committed your life to him, this is something you can do right now so you can partake in this, this, this supper. Because otherwise, it'd be taking of it unworthily and possibly bringing judgment on ourselves. And so two things we're called to do is, one, repent, Lord, I'm sorry. I don't want to live, I don't want to live as a slave to sin anymore. And secondly, I commit to you as my Lord and Savior. I'm going to follow you for the rest of my life. And so as we spend some time in examination, for those of you that do know the Lord, this is a time where you confess your sins before the Lord and get right back on the right path. And for those of you who may be here that don't know the Lord, this is a time where you can repent before the Lord, confess you are a sinner, and believe in him and, and, and confess your belief and commitment to follow him in your heart. 
And so if we could take some time, just a minute or so, to spend some time in prayer, confessing our sins, confessing him as our Lord, and committing to renew our focus that our master is coming and we're slaves of Christ and we're committed to following and obeying him. Let's spend some time in confession and prayer. And if someone can play as we do that. If there's someone here that's never made this commitment to Christ, I'm going to say a prayer, and you can make this your prayer in your heart. There's no power in the prayer itself, but if this is truly your commitment and your belief, and I, we believe the Holy Spirit does save you, that you do become born again, that he does break the power of sin over your life and becomes your Lord, and he begins to guide you through the word of God, guide you through, uh, through the, the fellowship of the saints um, so that he can use you to build his kingdom. And so if that's you and you want to make a commitment, just say this in your heart and make this your commitment and there's a sense in which us as believers, we're always making this commitment daily. Father, I thank you that 2,000 years ago, you sent your son to die on the cross for my sins. I thank you, dear Father. I confess that I am a sinner. I confess that I have fallen short of your glory, the ways you've called me to live. I thank you, God, again, that Christ died on the cross for my sins. He rose from the dead, which was proof that you accepted his sacrifice for my sins. I thank you for that. And Lord, I commit to you as being my Lord and Savior. Lord, would you send your Holy Spirit into my heart? Would you change me? Would you continue to make me anew? Would you use me to build your kingdom? Would you help, for me, help me to live for you daily? Father, we thank you for hearing the prayer of anyone's heart and here this morning that made that commitment. And we renew our commitment to you this morning as well. Father, we repent of ways that we've dishonored you with our minds, with our thoughts, not loving our neighbor as ourselves. We have put ourselves before everybody else in this world including you. We put ourselves before you and we ask for forgiveness for that. We thank you, Lord, that our bodies are not our own. Our free time is not our own. Our money is not our own. That everything is yours. But you purchased us. You paid that. You delivered us from the slave market not to go free. You delivered us from the slave market so we could follow you and become slaves of Christ and slaves of righteousness. And so, Father, forgive us because we have not lived that way at all times. We asked her, Father, this morning that you would make us, you said in Titus chapter 2, that you redeemed us, set, set it, it means pay the, the, the price to set us free from slavery, to make us eager for good works. We were not saved by our works, but you have called us to be righteous and to be eager for it. Lord, make that true of our campus. Make that true of every uh, member of our church, the children, those who are worshiping at home. Help us to be eager to do what's good as we serve you and honor you here on this hill and seek to affect the world from this hill. Lord, bless our taking of your bread, our remembering of your death 2,000 years ago. Bless this time as we remember the blood that purchased our forgiveness and broke the, broke the power of sin over our lives. And Father, as we take our bread, take the bread and take the cup, dear Father, we remember your coming. And we ask that you'd help us to be prepared and to live eagerly, awaiting for our Savior who's coming to this earth to make all things right. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's open our elements right now. If you could grab your bread. We'll wait one more second. Grab your head. 2,000 years ago, Christ's body was broken for you. Let's take of the bread. Thank you, Lord. 2,000 years ago, Christ's blood was shed for you so you could have forgiveness of sins 
and be set free from the power of sin. Let's take of his, his, his drink. Thank you, Lord. I want to invite EPT up here and that we can close and worship together. Let's go ahead and stand as we sing together. Sure. sinfully ask can we sing that again just want to meditate and sit on that a little longer the blood of Jesus it cleanses us it makes us righteous it renews us let's, let's meditate on that again as we sing the song
Amen. Before we close, if we could just take a second, pray for someone that came with you, pray for someone that's near you, and just take a second and begin to lift them up in Romans 6, 11, and talking about how the power of sin was broken over our lives. He says, reckon or consider yourself dead to sin, but alive to righteousness, I believe it is. It's either alive to righteousness or alive to Christ. Consider yourself dead to sin. Pray right now that whatever traps the enemy has set for them, whatever ways the enemies tried to discourage them, bring depression on their lives, whatever ways the enemies tried to pull them away from Christ, pull them away from the church, and, and draw them into de depression, discouragement, if you could just pray that God would, again, renew them right now through his spirit, that God would help them to walk in the victory that he purchased for them 2,000 years ago. Pray that they would grow more in love with God's word, more in love with God's people than they ever have before. Pray that God would anoint them and use them greatly for the kingdom of God. Even in the midst of a pandemic or times where things are restricted, that God would bless them and use them. And so just take a second as the Holy Spirit leads and pray for God's blessing on their lives, that they would be faithful servants when Christ comes, that they would be walking in faith, using their gifts for the kingdom, and God would be using them in a greater way they could ever ask or imagine, taking nothing but water that's, that's cheap and that doesn't cost a whole lot and just making it new as he makes wine and gives people joy and victory through them. Pray that God would pray over them, speak over them, and use them greatly. Pray for those around you right now, individually, and then pray for us as a church. Pray for those that are worshiping at home, that God would bless them. And let's just bless our church right now. Spend some time in prayer for one another. take one second and just begin to pray for this coming semester. There are new trials that await us new this coming semester, new victories, uh, new fruit that the Lord has for us. If we could just pray that God would go before us and bless this coming semester for HIC, for our university, pray for new students that are coming in, that God would give them grace to transition well with all the difficulties in getting to Korea and going through quarantine. Pray that God would be with them that he would protect them, that he would anoint the time if they're, as they're quarantining, as professors are quarantining, that it'd be a sanctuary of worship for the Lord. Pray that those, those that don't know Christ would come to know him in a special way on our campus. Pray that God would give us divine appointments, meeting with people, being able to speak life into them, being able to help them be set free from sin, being able to help them come to know the Lord. Pray that those who come to our campus would find a good church, whether it's here or somewhere else, where they can get involved and grow in the Lord. Pray that God would go before us and bless every class, every chapel, every small group, um, every meeting with others, and that God would glorify himself on this campus, that he'd make himself known, and we would experience him in special ways, whether we're restricted and can't meet together in person for small groups or we're gathering in small groups, whatever it be, that God would be moving on this campus and doing something very special here. Let's pray ahead for this coming semester and pray for great fruit for HIC. Pray for great fruit for yourself. Pray for God to bless those who are coming. Let's just lift up this coming semester.
one of the things we've struggled with as a church and other churches have struggled with and people in general is during the pandemic, we can't meet together like we would. We don't. We used to. We can't have the small groups in the same way we used to. And people maybe are less inclined to do the Zoom small groups. And so we've struggled with unity. We struggle with connection. People have struggled more with depression during this time because of those things. If we could pray whatever God has for us in this coming semester with the pandemic, that no matter what, there would be more unity in our church, uh, more love for one another, whether that means meeting together in one-on-one at the coffee shop or walking around a campus together, praying and meeting together, that there would be greater connections, greater healing um, for this, for, for our, our church in this coming semester, greater healing and restoration and community on our campus, more community in the churches. The churches in Seoul have had it way worse than we have. You know, they, many times they just haven't been, been able to meet together. Pray that God would restore community, restore relationships, bring refreshment on his church here in Korea, here on this campus, and this church around the world, that he heal his church, strengthen his church, make his church more vibrant in this coming season. Let's pray for greater community, relationships, um, and healing in this coming semester for our community and for others as well. Father, Lord, even as we studied in the text today, Father, Lord, we just ask, first of all, we thank you that you have allowed us to be partners in ministry with you. Though we don't get any recognition, and Lord, we don't even want recognition, but that you may be honored. And so we pray that you bring new wine on this campus, that you do a special work through your saints, in your saints, those that don't know you, that your spirit would move. There'd be joy in our church, joy in our homes, joy on this campus, joy in Korea, joy throughout the world. This has been a long season of difficulty. We ask that you bring something new, this fresh new wine. We can celebrate and have joy in you. And so, Father, we thank you that you have heard our prayers. We thank you that you've made us a family, and we ask that you'd make us even closer, even more intimate by whatever means necessary in this coming season that we'd love each other more, encourage each other more, meet with each other more, eat with each other more, celebrate with each other more, that you'd be glorified in our church, be glorified in our campus, glorified in your church throughout the world. We thank you, Father, for your goodness. We pray all this in your precious son's holy name. Amen. Let's give God a hand clap. We love you, God. Amen. God bless you guys. Have a wonderful Lord's Day.